it's also that it's inserted in a sort of capitalist economy where really only professional politicians have the time to do politics. Everyone else is so busy, you know, like working to make a living and raising their children and help their parents and they barely have time to read the news and they can be easily manipulated by media which are, you know, owned by a couple of corporations. So, so there's a whole issue that I want to touch on as well, which is um, how do we make the, the whole system more democratic, not just the government? You know, it's one thing to talk about open gov and transparency, and, and but that's fixing really one part of the problem. It's not fixing the, the more systematic issue of, okay, how do we give citizens time um, and opportunities to, to care about politics and, and, and really, you know, get involved? So I think technologies help a little because it's less time consuming to show up online when the kids are in bed and leave a comment or make a suggestion than to show up to a town hall meeting, for example, or or even campaign for, for a, you know, an official candidate or something like that. So I think to a degree the, the technologies help a bit in allowing um, people who are just too busy uh, to, to participate, but that, that's only solving a, a small part of the problem. So that's another dimension I, I want to look into. Okay, and one last question. Uh, do you think it is possible to try to measure uh, to, with, with new uh, indicators what democracy is and in this case how would you define a highly democratic society and in your criteria uh, what are the most democratic countries and societies in the world? Wow, so that's a really tough question. Well, I think a basic criterion for how democratic um, uh, a country is, is how democratic the people in it think it is. Um, so when you see again that in the US that uh, uh, the job approval rate of Congress is so low, uh, again oscillating between 9% and 33% at best, but in recent years uh, hovering around 10%, I think it's a really bad time. Um, people are not happy with, with the policies that have been chosen. They, and they, they rightly point out that the control by corporations and lobbies and, and interest groups. Um, so that's one sign. So I, I would say on the, on the continuum from non-democracy to democracy, the US is not doing that well, actually. Uh, if our, if our norm for democracy is, is a truly inclusive decision sort of system, um, that I would like to call, you know, post-representative democracy or something like that. Um, now, on the more democratic lines, I would imagine Switzerland is pretty good. Um, I know it's criticized heavily for some of its decisions, you know, the, some of these decisions are, are shocking by, you know, our, the standards of our, our, our elites in, in France or in the US, um, but they do reflect the desires of the population. So. From that point of view, I think the, the procedures are doing what they're supposed to do. And then I think clearly the Scandinavian countries are also um, very democratic. Uh, Finland in particular, uh, Norway, uh, Sweden, um, they have their problems, but they, they, there's, there's really an ethos, of, uh, an ethos of, of equality, political equality that, 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 that's so ancient. And I, there's an anecdote that was uh, given to me recently by a Norwegian uh, friend and scholar. He, he was saying how uh, Vikings went down some river in, in France, probably Normandy, actually where I'm from, and some uh, bystanders on, on the bank of the river yelled at them, who, are, who um, is your master? And they replied, puzzled, none, we are all equal and we don't have a master. I, I, just, I just think there's something really beautiful about that sort of, uh, you know, ethos really of, of political equality and democracy and not sure France had it that much actually. <laughs> we, we have a late um, uh, arrival of those ideals with, uh, with the French Revolution but uh, you know in, in the Scandinavian countries it seems to be much more um, uh, original to, to their history. Uh, to end with this conversation would you mind maybe to uh, let us some reflections about what the future of democracy should be and the biggest challenges for democracy uh, are today and for the future. Um, well, the future of democracy, I'm, I'm actually rather optimistic because I, I, at least I see it around me, I see a lot of people who are very passionate about making the government more open, more transparent, more responsive, you know, the, all these movements in open government, uh, that's already a 
a huge improvement in just a few years. And again, the Tunisian example, um, I had the chance to, to attend a talk by a, an activist there. They do amazing things, those young people. They, they managed to, to um, shame the members of parliament in Tunisia by showing that they never uh, you know, uh, show up in parliament. So they, 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 they take attendance and then they shame them publicly. And so, you know, that, that's, you know, they take a picture and they show the parliament is empty. The, the activists in Tunisia, they took pictures of the parliament to show that it's empty and, and so shame the, the members of parliament into, you know, doing their job actually. So, so I just have a sense that there's an energy around this ideal of democracy that's not going away. Uh, it's only going away in very uh, jaded countries like like the U.S. or or France to a degree. But I think the the, the and, and in very sort of a, again jaded circles of, of professional politicians or political scientists actually. But outside of those circles, I think people are really passionate about the idea, and it's not going anywhere. It's 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 here, it's here to stay. Um, um, what was your other question? The challenges. I think the I think the main challenge right now is the economic challenge. I think uh, inequalities both within domestic democracies and at the global level are such that it's going to be a problem and it's, it, it's, it's going to, I mean, can be a solution too in a way because the, the, that, the, the awareness of those inequalities may be in part responsible for the, the eruption of, uh, of the, you know, the Arab Spring in, in, in Egypt and Tunisia to begin with. But, but they're also a problem because a lot of violence is, is not the solution. So I think that's one of, going to be one of the issues. And the other issues, which is deeply connected to that one, is how are we going to cooperate internationally and, and coordinate uh, globally to solve some, some pressing issues. So I think these are the two main challenges that I see as uh, facing us right now. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you thank so much you for, for being with us and uh, for letting us uh, know a bit more about your research, about your work, and um, about uh, these reflections on uh, the new future of democracy. Thank you so much for the opportunity and good luck with your own uh, with your own attempt at changing the world. <laughs> okay, thank you. Adam.